Um, and we looked at two scenarios, one a higher cost scenario, which is meant to be representative of technology cost today, some of the key drivers being the cost of a solar PV module in US dollars per watt, and battery storage in US dollars per kilowatt hour. I think there are some of you that might say that that's actually out of date even for today. Um, uh, so these might be relatively high cost, which you could actually um, buy today. These are meant to be aggressive cost numbers. So experts estimate, you know, in the next 10 years or so, we could be down in the range of 50 cents a watt for solar modules and a dollar per kilowatt hour for the battery itself. Now, again, there's some data that suggests that those, that those kinds of numbers are available today. And so you can sort of, these are just meant to be scenarios for sort of base case and aggressive. Um, but you can choose your own numbers, and I'll, and I'll show you how you can do that in just a second. So we built a model that takes specific locations, fetches data from NASA for solar, uses global horizontal irradiance to then calculate an ISO reliability curve that I can talk a little bit more about in question and answer if you have any questions. And then simply does a cost minimization across basically a Pareto front for a particular reliability level to find the lowest cost uh, system for a given location and demand pattern um, and, a, and a, a given reliability. So let me show you how we think about our results then. Um, so let's, let's look at the higher technology cost first. So what we're looking at on the x-axis is fraction of demand served. This is the metric that I showed you before. So this would be four nines of reliability or 99.99. That's I stopped there because we believe that the technology itself might not be more available than that. Um, but that all of this unreliability is driven, as I said, just by solar um, and uh, storage uh, mismatch with electricity demand. And then here we have the levelized cost of energy of the system that gets built. And then we have a scatter of, plot of points because we're looking actually across the entire sub-Saharan Africa region. Um, but then if we, plot, if we plot one line, sort of find a best fit line through all of the data points that we get when we simulate across the entire continent, we see this remarkable log linear relationship. And the way to think about it, the way that I think about it, is that if I want to increase my reliability by one nine, go from 90 to 99%, I'm going to pay the same increment in dollars per kilowatt hour that I would if I wanted to increase my reliability by another nine, 99 .9, or sorry, 99 to 99.9. .9. So basically, there's this, I think, really interesting scaling, this linear scaling between nines of reliability and cost. So if we come over here and look at the uh, low cost scenario, which I think is quite plausible in the near future, if not already. The slope of this curve is three cents per kilowatt hour per nine, which means that if you wish to increase your reliability by a nine, you need to pay three cents over all of the kilowatt hours that you consume per kilowatt hour, which is something like maybe 10% of the average tariff across all of these uh, different regions. Um, just to put things into context. So here's the question then about parity. So for all of the countries that we had both um, retail electricity price data and reliability, we built these solar home systems in simulation uh, that had the same reliability and asked how much would they cost. And let's go over here and just look at the more aggressive cost scenario, this one here. So you can see, looking at the scale, at zero, that's this sort of gray, greenish blue color, that would mean that for a system that has the same reliability as the current grid, uh, a solar home system would cost the same as a retail tariff on the current grid for these different locations. So if it's a deeper blue, that means it's actually cheaper. If it's, a, if it's more green or yellow, that means that it's more expensive. So by our estimates, it's roughly 30% of the area could reach grid parity under this low cost scenario which begins to sort of, I think, just call into question whether or not we should be uh, building more expensive, potentially more expensive networks to get out to uh, remote locations. I'll come back to some of the uh, reasons that we might not think it's, a, there's certainly not an easy answer. But, yes? No, no, so um, each, for each country, we have a different reported reliability from industrial surveys. And so we use the reliability of that country to build these systems. Yes? Is that planned or unplanned reliability? 
uh, it's the combination of all of these things. So it's what enterprises report to the World Bank for how often they have access to electricity. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and so we do. There, there. Um, uh, we can go back to the plot later if you wish, but, 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 and 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 that's also it's a countrywide average. So it's there's some regions certainly that have 50% unreliability, and actually the whole of Nigeria is that in that situation. Uh, but but locally, you could certainly see even greater unreliability. We were only able to look at the country level. Yeah. Yeah, great. So, um, so we, aha, okay, I have 10 minutes. Uh, so we assume that the cost scale linearly with demand. Um, so I think the challenge would be for high demand levels, um, if you have peaky demand, then you could have a very expensive system, and I'll get back to talking about that in just a second. So we assume that the demand is relatively smooth, and that then the cost just scales linearly. But, but I'll come back to that, and we can talk more in Q&A if you want. So we, we built, um, if you wish to do alternative scenarios, we built a website, emac.berkeley.edu slash reliability, where you can put in all your own cost numbers. You can put in, uh, select your own load profile if you wish, uh, choose different locations, and see what outcomes you think would happen in different scenarios. So I encourage people, if they're interested in this area, to play around with this website. Um, also, all of the code that we use is um, open sourced and on GitHub, um, and you can reference that in the paper that we uh, published. So OK, just a couple of takeaways on this electrification pathway. So it suggests that there's a credible alternative to what is very long lead time grid expansion in these regions. Uh, and then there's also, I think this just, uh, perhaps not so simple, is simple in my mind, but uh, maybe it takes some time to wrap your head around this number, three cents per kilowatt hour per nine, which is this interesting number that suggests that customers can with certainty, or some certainty, sort of dial in the reliability. How much do they want to spend for particular reliability? Okay, but so then the challenges, I think. So certainly if the big grid eventually comes and people invest in decentralized infrastructure, that represents an overinvestment and maybe much more social cost in total than we would rather spend. And then this is the point that I, I think people were beginning to talk about a little bit earlier, these so-called productive loads. So we've worked a little bit with uh, Carbon Trust in the UK um, who are actually funding uh, projects specifically for productive loads. So think motors, milling, manufacturing, um, agricultural loads, which might be on only a fraction of the time. And so in this case, I think that there is a need, and we're beginning to do some research in this area, to look for options to network these devices together, but at small scales to do power sharing. So we can talk more about that if you want in Q&A. And then I think that you know, based on the cost model, there's a, still a remaining question about whether universal access is possible. Uh, there might need to be some sort of public funding to get all uh, in a population to get access to electricity by this pathway. And then there's certainly important uncertainty with respect to solar and battery cost projections, as well as cost to extend the grid. We can talk more in Q&A. So now, defection. Let me, uh, this should take a little bit less time because we use essentially the same model. But let me define some things first. So load defection. So now we're shifting to a world where people are already grid connected. And we want to know, does decentralization make sense? So load defection is the thing that maybe you've heard plenty about before, where customers install behind the meter solar to offset the variable cost of the grid, but they don't disconnect. So they still use the grid for reliability purposes and for net metering. Um, so in places where you have high volumetric retail tariffs, load defection um, is quite a problem for many utilities, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, potential solutions. Grid defection is a different beast, where customers permanently disconnect from the grid to avoid the total cost of electricity. And so this is more driven by fixed charges. So if you have a very high and regular fixed charge, then you come to a point where you would say, I prefer just to completely disconnect from the system um, rather than net meter with solar. So I have a plot here I won't go into to describe the basic sort of economics of that decision. So we looked at two questions in this case. First, how does rate design shift the private economics of grid defection? 
And question two, how do customer preferences for reliability? So reliability comes up again, change this decision. So to do this, we focused on the United States. We had much more detailed load data. We looked specifically at residential grid defection, and we have from the Department of Energy uh, on very sp fine spatial scales, uh, electricity load, sort of typical load patterns that we fed into our model. We also had um, from the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, solar data that we fed into the model. And we looked at different demand levels for a low, high, and base demand level, and then used the low technology cost uh, assumption from before. So uh, I'll talk about the location-specific electricity tariffs on the next slide. But the basic um, modeling approach was to enable uh, rational economic decision. And I acknowledge that customers might not always be rational when they make these, or at least not in the sort of pure microeconomic sense, um, when they make grid defection decisions. But they have a decision just on pure economics to remain grid connected, load defect, or grid defect. And we'll look at how these things change in different scenarios. So here's our rate data. We can talk a lot more about this. I could spend 10 minutes talking about how the rate data work. But the, the, the short summary is that we have at the county level in the United States an ability to uh, see first what is the fixed charge and variable charge that customer, residential customers currently pay. And then second, what if we took a utility's private marginal cost, essentially just the cost of their energy, and we made that the customer's variable charge, and then all remaining costs, all fixed costs, would go into, um, the fixed costs from the utility would go into a fixed charge on the customer bill. All customers would see the same fixed charge at the level of the county, which is what we have our result, data result at. Um, okay, so first case, perfect reliability. So we size systems using that same model that I showed you before to serve all load given solar availability in historical records. That's for the grid defection case. Um, and as you might imagine, you have to build a really big system to be able to do that, 100% reliable over 10 years of load and solar data. So what we see in this case, uh, in, if we use current rate structures, most of, and this is in the low cost scenario, most of the US would grid defect. So we're here we're looking at, or sorry, load defect. So this is low load, base load, and high load customers. But not many would grid defect. That is completely disconnect if we move to a situation where we have private marginal cost rates and high, sorry, private marginal cost for the variable portion of the customer bill. So the utility private marginal cost gets passed on to the variable part of the customer bill. And then the fixed charge on the customer bill reflects all of the utility's fixed costs. So maybe, I, I think I glossed over this a little bit too quickly, but what's happening is one thing you might expect, less load defection because now there's less of a volumetric charge for the customers to, uh, to defer with on-site solar, but we get a little bit more grid defection in this case because we have a higher fixed charge. So the customers are saying, ah, I don't want to pay that fixed charge, even though the volumetric charge is relatively low. Um, and then I should have pointed out this chart, this legend will come up on the next slide as well, so we have no defection, load defection, and grid defection. Okay, so then the second case we looked at was what we call flexible load. Customer receives 99% of energy in their load profile, but they're never completely without. So we say 300 watts is always available to power critical loads. And that's the, just the model that we used, and we can talk more about the right model um, in Q&A. And in this case, we see much more grid defection happening. So this sort of drives home the importance of understanding better how customers prefer, what customers prefer with respect to how reliable and the characteristics of the service that they get with um, a standalone system. Um, okay, so coming back to these motivating questions, how does rate design shift private economics of defection? In most of the US, equating customer volumetric cost to utility private marginal cost completely disincentivizes load defection, which utilities and economists might think is the right thing to do. But grid defection becomes preferable in some low load customers, assuming that all customers receive, again, the same fixed charge. For the second question, how do customer preferences for electric reliability change that decision? This is the sort of $64,000 question. As you might expect, just a very small reduction in reliability uh, requirements 
has very big effects on what customers are willing to do, and that's because the system can be significantly smaller to go from 100% reliability to 99% reliability. Um, okay, let me just go ahead then and kind of wrap up uh, with this question, will decentralized make a dent in the utility model? So I think if solar and storage costs continue to decline, it appears to be an important pathway for energy delivery. Much more important than I would have thought when I sort of came into this area. I used to be much more of a sort of centralized person. I thought decentralization was a, a silly thing to be doing, but I think the economics are quite suggestive. But reliability is extremely important, and we need much more understanding about customer preferences for reliability. And we have a few in my research group at uh, UC Berkeley. We have a few different projects where we're trying to empirically estimate these things. Um, particularly in unelectrified regions, I think we need productive loads. Uh, we need to give them special attention. And we're looking at a project now with modular network ability, as I suggested before. This is really important, I think. We need planning models that realistically capture decentralization. I, I really believe that this needs to be incorporated more and more into the models that we use for thinking about grid expansion. And then I think, uh, quite importantly, equity must be factored into policy decisions. If we're going to embrace decentralization, then we'll need measures to ensure universal access goals are met. If we're going to fight it, we'll need to think carefully about how total cost and equity impacts of those tariff designs trickle down to different constituents. And with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So we'll keep the questions until the Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much for keeping mm -hmm. us time. Yes. Uh, and now we hand the floor over to Denise Game. I hope yes. I'm pronouncing that correctly. And from Johns Hopkins with an S, That's I right. believe. Yes. Unlike the programmer, it's John Hopkins. Uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, same routine. Are you this one? This one here? Oh, I'll give you. It's in game, yes. So, this works? All right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit different, perhaps, than other people have talked about at the conference. And, you know, I think it's quite clear from all of the talks we've been to that renewable energy share of global electricity is really growing. And in a lot of places, including New Zealand, does this work? Oh, yeah. A lot of that is hydropower, um, which is different than the variable renewables. But I'm going to argue that wind is actually growing at a rapid rate that's really important to consider in this picture. And if you look at that globally, you can see, you know, lately wind is growing a lot. We've heard a lot in the talks I've been to anyway about how much that's growing in Australia. And I'm going to focus a lot on the U.S., where wind power is actually going to surpass hydropower. So wind is really becoming a significant player in the U.S.'s electricity market beyond all of the other renewables. And in fact, in 2019, the most capacity additions in the U.S. were from wind. And it's also predicted to be the most capacity additions from wind and a combination of wind and solar, but wind is slightly higher in 2020. And this doesn't include behind the meter. But, you know, one can argue that now wind is no longer a niche supplier. So maybe this is a little controversial in this, in this audience, but I think as this changes and wind becomes a bigger player, a more important part of the world energy supply, it's not a niche supplier anymore. So this model we have of wind as negative demand and putting it as net demand, what uh, was called this morning as free power or free energy, making it must take and you have to pay them and you have to subsidize them, it's a fundamental problem for our electric power system. And we really need to think about this differently as we move from it being uh, a niche supplier. Because if you make the assumption that it's a niche supplier and you can treat it differently and it's just negative demand and you calculate net demand, there's no incentive for a wind power operator to do anything but just give you all of its power 
all of the time. And I, I heard a talk, I can't remember who it was from, that said, why would I, you know, how do I convince GE to make bigger turbines if they're not going to operate them all the time in the session this morning? So this is a real problem if the economic model is you incentivize someone for producing more power all of the time. And so the problem about this is really, and we all know this, but I, I like to put it up, is you know, this is what a demand curve does. So wind, you know, if it's a significant portion of the energy supply, it needs to respect that this is what the demand curve looks like, or we're going to potentially have problems. And these are big system problems, and it's far beyond a balancing problem. You know, yesterday there was also discussion about the fact that it's also a reactive power problem. It's a regulation problem and it's a voltage support problem. So it affects all sorts of things. And so all of these critical grid services, many in many markets in many countries that are not even paid for. So I learned in this, this morning that in a lot of countries they don't even have these regulation markets. They're just services that are provided by conventional generators. It becomes a real problem. And in the US, there's a lot of push-pull from the conventional generators that say, hey, wait a second. I have to have a lower power factor so I can provide some reactive power. And these people are doing this for free. And now they're cost competitive, and you're paying them subsidies. This is just not good for the economics of my business. So it's, it's, it's creating a lot of economic problems. And so in a lot of places, people are saying, well, maybe wind needs to provide these services, whether that be through a battle or something else, but it can't be that now in a system where you have 20, 30, 40 percent wind, the conventional generators are relied on to do all of these services. So in my mind, as a person who models wind farms, the question is, can wind farms do this without, say, purchasing some sort of backup generation to go with them, having a gas turbine or some storage with them? You know, what are the barriers from a wind farm operator in terms of doing this? And for me, this, there's really two questions you need to answer. You know, how do you obtain some accurate predictions for your power output over a wide range of conditions? So for me, this is a modeling problem. I'm a mathematical modeler, so I love modeling problems. So this is a modeling problem. But the problem that's probably more interesting to people here is really this problem of how do you ensure that wind farms can participate in markets? Because right now, they don't really participate in the market. They just get paid for their power output which is not really market participation. And so how do you ensure that that can happen? And for me, that's a control problem. How do I control my wind farm so that it can behave in the ways that are needed to participate in these markets? And so I'm going to talk about two different ways that a wind farm could participate, or two different types of markets. Um, and they're very idealized conditions, but it's really a proof of concept I want to show you is frequency regulation and price arbitrage. So, you know, when we think about wind farms, and a lot of times when I go to conferences in economics, we sort of model these things as, you know, a single output, and we just model a single turbine, and we kind of multiply it by some number or something like that. But the physics in a wind farm is really, really complicated. And so I'm going to talk about using knowledge of that physics in order to show you that wind farms can do more than we think they can do. And they can do more if we model them in, in an interesting and in more complicated ways. And so just to motivate this, I just want to talk about how big wind turbines are and how far apart wind turbines in a wind farm are. So if you think about this, you know, so if you look at a home and you look at the Statue of Liberty, so this is a, an American-centric, or you look at a 747, which again is, an, is another antiquated thing because they've now retired the 747s, but very, very large planes, you know, the diameter of wind farm is on that order. They're just huge. And so these wind farms, a typical turbine diameter, and this is even old now because now they have 250 meter diameter turbines that they're putting offshore. So this is huge. And when you think about this, they typically sp space them about seven diameters apart, right? So that's kilometers. And that's just two, right? You think about a whole farm, there's many, many, many of them. All right, so if you think about this in terms of an operational speed, which is really usually about eight meters per second, but I'm going to use 10 because the math is easier. So then the interturbine travel speed between the first row and the second row is about 70 seconds. That's an entire minute, 
right? So if you think of a large farm, maybe it has 10 rows, your wind that came into the farm is taking 15 minutes almost to travel through that farm. It's a really long time. And so there's a lot you can do with that time while your wind is in there if you understand the fluid dynamics of what's going on there. And don't worry, I'm not going to go and talk about fluid dynamics. I'm just going to talk about how we use this knowledge. All right. So what we need to do, then do is we need to have a model that captures the really complicated behavior in a way that we can use it in control. So we need to be able to understand enough of the physics to make a simplified model that we can use in our, in our control strategies. Um, and so what I use is this particular model, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we really assume that however the wind comes into the turbine, what the velocity deficit or the wake, so the wake is really the reduction in kinetic energy as the energy is taken out of the wind from the farm mechanically. So behind the turbine, if you remember kinetic energy is one half mv squared. On the other side, you have less energy, so your velocity is less. So that's your wake or your velocity deficit. And so that velocity deficit is going to move at whatever speed the wind came into the turbine at initially. And so you can use a lot of um, turbulence theory and some momentum theory to build a model about this. And then you can superimpose these wakes with a simple, you know, the sum of the kinetic energy squared. And so I can talk to you about the physics until I'm blue in the face if you want to ask questions about that. So now that we have this model, and it's a dynamic model, so it varies with time, which allows us to do things like when the wind speed changes, we can now change how fast wind is going through the farm, or if the wind has slowed down at row three, we now have a difference in the speed at row three that we can take into account, which is important because that means the turbines in row three are now taking out less energy than the turbines in row one, and that is always the case in a wind farm. All right, so the frequency regulation market, and it was talked about this morning um, by Richard Green, so we're not going to spend a lot of time in it, but I'm using 60 hertz, though, um, is really about balancing load and generation. So generation gets too fast, the frequency goes up. If load gets too much, I mean, generation gets too high, the, the frequency goes up. If load gets too high, then the frequency goes down, and vice versa. And so when you have an event, what will happen is you'll have some initial disturbance, and then you'll have the frequency dip down to the lowest level, which takes about 10 seconds. And then generally speaking, and you know, historically in grids, you have these large rotating machines, and they will rotate the system back into a good spot. Because there's a lot of inertia in these systems, you can, of course, do this synthetically, as was discussed this morning. And then you have some sort of secondary signal, because you have all of these rotating machines, and they're all sort of rotating and trying to get the system back. So you have some trajectory that you need to follow to actually get it back to the correct level, because all of these different things are working together, this, these network effects. And then you have this tertiary control that just gets you to the point where everything is working again. And so what I'm going to talk about in terms of the wind farm is this secondary frequency regulation. So not the primary frequency regulation, which is mostly inertia, but the secondary one that happens from about 30 seconds to about tens of minutes. And so how you do this in practice is you have some sort of signal and, oh, sorry, I'm using the wrong. You have some sort of signal that you want to follow. You break it into a bulk power signal and a regulation signal. So this is the energy you're selling to the bulk market. So you're not selling all of your energy into frequency regulation. And this is the, mar the energy you're selling into the regulation market. All right. So in a wind farm, you know, it's a conservation of energy thing. So if I'm going to be able to ramp up to follow a signal like this, I need to back off on the amount of power that I'm giving into the bulk market or whatever to have the ability to ramp up. I can't make energy from nothing, basically. So I do what's known as derating. I, you know, I basically feather my blades so I'm not taking out the maximum amount of energy, which people are saying, oh my gosh, now the wind power is losing money. But I'm going to explain to you why that may not be a huge problem in this case. And so you, then you can get the up ramp. So this D rate amount, I'm going to call it alpha, is some percentage. And so my bulk power is just what I had before 
minus this D rate percentage, right? So now this, that's my P max, and now I can ramp up at some percentage alpha. And so there's obviously a direct economic trade-off between this alpha and this gamma, right? If I have to derate by 5% to get a 5% ramp up, then, you know, it's sort of a one-to-one -one thing, and I better be getting paid as much in the regulation market as I was in the energy market for me as a wind operator to make this economically feasible. Now, if I'm mandated to do it, that's a different question, but I'm thinking about it from the perspective of, can I do this in a way that's economically feasible? Um, if that answer to that question is, if I need to derate by 5% to get 5%, most of the time that's not economically feasible um, because of the difference in the prices. And so there's been studies that show 99% of the hours that's just not economically feasible. However, there's huge benefits for the system. And it's a rather old story, study from 2014, but it was actually shown that if you let wind farm operators do this, it could actually save $19 million in the California energy market because of the added flexibility. Now, this is before storage was mandated and some of the other sources of flexibility, so there wasn't a lot of flexibility in the system. So the economics of this has probably changed, but it certainly is beneficial to the system, so there may be positive economic system-wide costs associated with it. Now, this is a very difficult problem because as I told you before, it takes 10 minutes for my wind to go through the wind farm, and I'm talking about something that's on the time scale of 30 seconds to 10 minutes. So you can see I'm trying to change the output of the entire wind farm while the wind that came in is still in this wind farm. So this is a difficult problem, and people tried to do it in, you know, the most naive way by saying, okay, let's just try and control every turbine to follow this signal. Um, and there's this beautiful study um, that Paul Fleming did that just used a very simple wind farm and showed if you want to track this signal and you do that, your first row tracks everything beautifully because the first row doesn't have any wake problems, so that's fine. The second row doesn't do so well, nor does the third. And the total power output of the wind farm looks like this, which is nothing like the signal you want to track. So that just does not work. Um, and so this is a problem too in terms of our modeling because if you model it this way, then you also, if you model everything as a single turbine, you're also not capturing this phenomena. So that's actually really important because a lot of economic models sort of treat wind farms as a single turbine that you multiply by some number. And you really can't do that for this particular problem. All right, so what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna use a control strategy where we use this dynamic wake model that knows how long it takes wind to get from one turbine to the next turbine, and thereby will allow us to do this type of control in a more intelligent way because it's calculating what the wind power output of every turbine is based on this model of how long the wind takes to get there and what its velocity will be when it gets there. And so we put this into some sort of complicated control strategy where we control things by this parameter, which is basically the pitch of the turbine, so it's the, what's been used to control things. And then we put it in a large fluid dynamics simulation. There's an output an output of that pictured here. So you can see actually here, this is where the wind farm is. We actually simulate the entire atmospheric boundary layer coming into this to give us realistic conditions so we get the types of oscillations you see. In practice, it's an 84 turbine farm we have here, and you can see the wakes, these low speed velocity things behind the turbines. So it's a fairly realistic simulation of what's going on. All right, so we wanted to test whether or not we could do this as a proof of concept using data. So we're using data from the PGM market, which is the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland market, um, which is in part of the US, and they have a secondary frequency regulation market. And so in order to qualify to participate, they give you different signals you need to track, and you need to track it under some metrics in order to see if that's going to work. So these are the two types of regulation signals they have. They have a reg A signal, which is basically a low pass filter on the area control error. So this is really some 
very complicated mathematical formula that takes into account the imbalance and some other factors in order to give the signal. So it's very complicated because, of course, it's about all these different generators working together. And then they have this high pass filter on the signal, which was really designed for batteries. So it's very nice in that it integrates to zero. And it was designed because they figured batteries were going to be big players in this market um, at the time. And so we did this on 48 different cases, qualification data and historical signals. We wanted to do 8% regulation, so we want to be able to go 8% up and 8% down around our baseline signal. We used three different initial conditions, so that's three different instances of the atmospheric boundary layer as an inflow, but then we march it in time. So different things will happen based on what's happening in terms of control signal. And we use D rates of 4 and 6%. So I'm not asking for my wind farm to derate by 8% to get 8%. I'm asking for it to derate by half as much, so, or three quarters as much. So I'm saying I don't want to lose all of this money in the bulk energy market. I only want to lose half, and I want to see if I can still do it by taking advantage of the physics. All right, so here's the results. So this shows the two different types of signals on the four metrics that are used. So there's an accuracy score, which is self-explanatory, a delay score, how far behind the signal you are, a precision score, which is difficult to explain. I could explain it offline. And then a composite score. And this shows that we actually pass in all of the cases for all of the regulation, even if it's 50%. Um, of the D-rate, so that says we're doing this efficiently, and so from an economic perspective, we're not losing as much money to do this participation, so it means that this may be economically viable depending on the difference in the prices in the system, and as been talked about at this conference, flexibility is becoming more and more valuable. So this is a good thing. This is what our signals look like. So basically, what's happening here from a physics perspective, so this is the control signal. This is the first row of the wind farm, and this is the last row of the wind farm. So what's happening is really, in order to track this signal, and actually it's probably more clear over here, what we're doing is we're holding kinetic energy in the farm. We're taking less energy out at the front in order to have more energy left in the wind so we can take more energy out at the back rows. And so this ability to understand how much kinetic energy you're going to have at any point in time in the farm allows us to hold kinetic energy and take it out when we need it. And of course, you only have as much as the length of your farm. So this, this is really dependent on that. But in the types of large offshore wind farms that are becoming more and more popular, this is, this is a feasible strategy. All right, so this is also an interesting aspect of this. Um, if you look at the uncontrolled case versus our controlled case, we're also taking out quite a bit of variability in terms of the wind farm output. So our control is actually making the wind farm output signal be a lot better, so they're a lot better for the grid. So that's another benefit of the strategy. All right, so there's lots of assumptions here, and I'm going to skip these, and we can even ask me questions about them later. But, but the, the takeaway here is this requires you to have constant sort of wind speed coming in for 10 minutes to an hour, which is actually quite common in places like offshore conditions in the US and Texas, where you have strong prevailing wind conditions. And if you have good forecast data or a LIDAR, you know when you have that, so you need to be able to sign on and off from the market when you know you can participate based on the weather. Um, all right. So the second thing I'm going to talk about very, very briefly in my less than five minutes is another sort of toy problem that we've looked at is, so we know we can store kinetic energy in the farm. Can we use this for short-term price arbitrage? So in the US now, they give you the LMPs or predicted LMPs about 15 minutes ahead of time, sometimes up to an hour ahead of time. And if you know that, can you make intelligent decisions with your wind farm in order to take advantage of this on these short-term basis? So the way that this works is you're moving along, you have your steady state maximum power output, and then you turn off the first row of your turbines, your total power decreases, um, and you'll, that goes along for a little while until the wake behind that completely disappears. Then you turn it back on and you get this huge increase in power because now you have two rows 
of unwaked turbines. So you have the total power that's coming out. The kinetic energy available at the first and second rows is about the same. So you get a huge power boost in from that. And so then, of course, the weight comes back and it goes back down. So this is only good for a short period of time. But in a five-minute you know, real-time market, that's long enough for, to take advantage of something like this. Um, so the storage efficiency here is about 45%. So you just take you know, basically the amount of power you lost here divided by the total power here to get the efficiency. So this is basically how this works. Um, so you can then try and maximize your revenue by doing this, by looking at the LMPs and calculating this based on some um, constraints on your system. So your rated power, your available power, and the amount of power that you're able to store, which is going to, of course, depend on the size of your wind farm. Um, so, you know, we're going to neglect certain things. We assume we have perfect knowledge of prices, that these predicted prices are really good. Um, we're going to look at regularly aligned wind farms, and we're going to use an idealized wind farm aerodynamic model for this. Um, so, those are sort of these aligned and staggered configurations. So, you're looking from the top and you're just looking down at where the turbines are and what the wakes sort of look like. So, you can do this with historical prices on an 84 turbine aligned wind farm or various other types of farms with 3 megawatt turbines. So, that's one diameter, 5 megawatt, 8 and 15, which are the bigger ones. And you can kind of see that. With the historical prices and the historical price volatility, this doesn't really pay. But if you look at a price volatility index and figure out how volatile things need to be, and we just kind of define this volatility index as volatility in prices between this time period and the next time period. So very short term in terms of these five minute markets. And so it's probably not a good name for it, but that's what we're defining. And so you can show that if volatility increases substantially, which we expect it to because of variable renewables and because of changes to our grid system, that this can actually create substantial revenues. So you can see that as the rated power goes up, you can get substantial revenues. And this is just the different spacings between the turbines. So the, depending on the spacing between the turbines, tells you how much power you're going to lose from one row to the next. It also tells you the storage efficiency, because it tells you how long it takes for that dip to happen and the recovery to happen, because it's about the inter-turbine travel distance. And this just shows you that it's actually working. If you look at the LMPs, you can see that when they're high, that's when you do this arbitrage. All right, so I'm done now, so hopefully I'm on time. But I think the, the takeaway here, you know, from these toy models is that really wind farms can do more than we're ex expecting them to do in our economic models. We really don't need to design them and model them as, you know, net load, right? We really can expect them to do more, and I think we need to expect them to do more in order to have them integrate in our system in ways that don't require us to track them with perhaps a dirtier type of generation, and in ways that you know makes the whole system happy. And I, I think we really need to think about these things as we do the economic models, because otherwise we, our markets might not be efficiently designed because we have bad assumptions going into our models about what the actual assets in our models are doing. So I'm going to leave that with my collaborators. So um, Charles Menevo does the fluid simulation codes. Um, so he allowed us to do a lot of this work. And these are my students who do all of the work that I talk about all of the time. <laughs> Thank you for another interesting presentation, and thank you also for keeping to time. Uh, we're doing well so far. Uh, next, we hand the floor over to Brian Everett uh, from CapsArc, and I think Brian's going to give us a slightly different twist, more closely aligned to smart cities, as I understand. Somewhat smart. Some, somewhat smart. Uh, so. Okay. Um, oh, do I need a microphone? You can take this oh. microphone. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, oh no, that's still yeah, right. this, this is fine. Okay. Great. Um, so my name is Brian Eford, for those who don't know me. Um, I lead a team called the Policy and Decision Science Team at CAPSARC. Uh, it's, I'm a political scientist by training, so a little bit different take on things here. And just to give you a, a kind of a preview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to mostly describe a problem that we're trying to solve right now. I'll describe kind of a paradigmatic 
approach to that problem. And at the very end, I'll talk about the computational model that we're ultimately going to build. But we're at a relatively early stage of this research. So um, the, the kind of detail, the technical detail will be, you know, in a talk maybe in the future. Um, and and uh, coming from Saudi Arabia, um, I'm going to be talking about the city of Riyadh. And, and I guess the other uh, 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 alibi that I should give is uh, the team who does most of the work right now um, aren't here, um, so I'm talking on their behalf. Uh, but I'll be doing, working on the more interesting part, well, the part that I'll find very interesting at the end, but um, again, that's, a, that's maybe next year we can talk about the, uh, that part of the project. So let me just start, uh, for those of you, and I think just looking around the room, I, I suspect most of you have not been to Riyadh, but I hope in a couple of years when the IAEE is hosted in Riyadh, you'll all attend and, and get to see a little bit of what I'm talking about. So let me just describe to you uh, a bit about the city of Riyadh so you get some context for the problem that we have or the, the challenges that it has. So uh, most of you probably know Saudi Arabia is mostly a desert. Um, Riyadh is located in the center of the country on an elevated plain. Um, so it's quite hot most of the year, um, although right now it's quite pleasant. Um, it's a, you know, a decent sized city. Um, the population uh, last year was around 7 million people, um, but it's grown very fast. It's a very new city. So in 1950, um, it was mostly mud brick houses and about 100,000 people. So in those 60 years, 70 years, gosh, it's, it's getting late, uh, uh, things, things have changed quite a bit. About 30% of the people in, in Riyadh are expatriates. Um, we don't really know the exact numbers. There hasn't been a census in 10 years, but uh, hopefully we'll validate that. Uh, there's a census going on this year, so we hopefully we'll know a little bit better um, then uh, uh, what the numbers are. And then I guess finally, um, something to keep in mind is about a third of the population are, are live in poverty, which is, I think, defined by this study is around $600 a month. Uh, uh, so even though everyone thinks of Saudi Arabia as a very wealthy country, and it certainly is with oil revenues, um, there is a lot of poverty and a lot of challenges, especially in the expatriate population, which is probably even higher if we were to count them all properly. Um, there's not a lot of good data on, on poverty rates in the city. So let me talk a little bit, um, actually, let me just go back one, one slide. I mean, there's, there's, there's another layer of context that's also important, which is social changes that are going on in the country as well. Okay, so in 2018, the country was quite different than it is today. Um, in 2018, uh, women were not allowed to drive. So most women, uh, most of them didn't work. Um, there was an increasing number of women who were well-educated, um, but didn't have a lot of outlets for that education in terms of the labor market. Um, but in 2019, uh, 2019, a lot of things have changed, and they continue to change even today. So in the middle of last year, uh, women were allowed to drive. Um, so uh, the kind of foreign expat uh, drivers who were hired to drive women around, or the families who were driving women around, uh, suddenly were freed up a little bit more. Um, and actually, if you were to show up in Riyadh today, you'd see women working everywhere. Uh, so that's a massive change. And it's going to have energy implications as well when we talk about things like uh, the, the urban environment and transportation in the city. Um, so, you know, other issues, you know, the, the guardianship laws are going away.